I'm going to be presenting on augmented reality-based mimicry attacks on behavior-based smartphone authentication. Uh, this work was done with my postdoc hosts, Ursheng Gartner uh, and Daniel Vogel. So behavior biometrics uh, authenticates users based on their unique device usage pattern. Uh, this could be uh, measured through different things, for instance, how a person swipes on their device, as well as how a person enters uh, text on the device. And generally, it uses uh, features like this. So for instance, if a person is uh, typing, we have this feature called keyhole, uh, which looks at the amount of time a person presses a key. And then similarly, we have another feature, uh, interstroke interval, which looks at a uh, time uh, interval between the release of the first key and the press of second key. So behavior-based solutions are available on smartphones. So recently, Samsung announced the integration of behavior-based authentication in their NexiSign authentication platform. And then we have uh, about over a dozen uh, companies that have these different solutions. So Typing DNA is one company. And among other advantages of their solution, uh, they claim that typing biometrics verification is very difficult to spoof. Uh, so in this uh, talk, we're going to uh, step into attacker's shoes, and we're going to try to see how difficult it is to spoof uh, typing biometrics. So in order to um, spoof typing biometric or mount mimicry attacks, the attacker needs two things. So first, the attacker needs access to the uh, behavioral profile of the victim. And there are several ways to do that. So imagine uh, the victim goes and visits a website when the victim is uh, typing a comment on that website. Uh, the person who's operating the website would be able to uh, collect this uh, typing behavior. And there are other methods, for instance, behavior databases may get leaked. And very recently, we had this paper at NDSS this year uh, where uh, the researchers showed uh, that the attackers may collect these different types of typing uh, behavior. So a person put a comment on their website, and then how that behavior can be used to reconstruct password entry behavior of the user. So for the purpose of this talk, we do not uh, address this problem. We assume that using one of these methods, the attacker already has access to the behavioral profile of the victim. Our focus is on reproducing victim's behavior. And there are two scenarios for that. So first one is user to website authentication scenario. Uh, that is slightly easy because what the attacker can always do is create this bot uh, which mimics the behavior of the user. A more challenging scenario is user-to-device authentication scenario. Uh, and for that scenario, uh, the victim's device is generally protected using password. Uh, and uh, the problem is that the attacker cannot install anything on the victim's device without bypassing that password. So what we've come up with is generic solution that enables the attackers to mimic victim's behavior without tampering or installing anything on the victim's device. So over here, uh, this is how the uh, uh, attack placement works. So uh, the attacker has uh, their own device placed on the edge of uh, the table. And what the attacker does is uses the front camera of their device to capture the screen of the victim's device. So here, we see the attacker's view. And now, in order to uh, type anything uh, which maps to the victim's behavior, we provide real-time feedback to the attacker using augmented reality. Okay. So this setup effectively uh, does not require us to modify or install anything on the victim's device and enables the attacker uh, to mimic the victim's behavior. And there are several challenges to that. Uh, so to understand those challenges, let's revisit the keystroke authentication. So here, uh, we talk about this uh, scheme that was published at CHI uh, in 2016 by Buschek and others. So if you look at this scheme, it uses 24 features to capture victims' behavior. And these features include things like temporal features, including keyhole behavior. Uh, it includes contact feature, which looks at the amount of uh, pressure a user exerts on their screen. And it also uses spatial features, which include things like the exact touch point on the device screen. So uh, for the purpose of this talk, we're going to uh, use this scheme because not only it uses the largest uh, feature set, but it also has pretty high accuracy uh, among these keystroke behavior-based authentication schemes. So here are the challenges. So the first challenge is that the attacker uh, needs to mimic 
behavior across three different feature categories. And that's challenging. And to add to that challenge, we see that some of these features uh, require dexterity uh, at milliseconds level. So consider key hold interval. So for key hold interval, uh, the attacker needs to reproduce this behavior in tens of milliseconds. And that is pretty challenging. So our objective was to uh, develop a system, a generic system, which enabled attackers uh, to mimic this behavior uh, without installing anything on the victim's device. Uh, and for purpose of this talk, uh, we consider uh, this uh, case study where the attacker is required to mimic password entry behavior on smartphones. And for our threat model, we assume that the attacker knows the password of the user. And using one of the means that we uh, described previously, uh, the attacker has access to the entry behavior of the victim. And our goal is to enable the attacker uh, to bypass this scheme in minimum number of attempts. Uh, to enable that, we take this two-staged approach. So in the first uh, phase, the attacker trains uh, to mimic the victim behavior on their own device. And once the attacker feels uh, confident, the attacker moves to the victim's device uh, and uh, uses our method to obtain guidance on the victim's device. Okay. So before we uh, jump to how we train the attacker, it's uh, uh, important to kind of reduce the training complexity because, hey, 24 features are a lot. So we use this two-phased approach. So in the first phase, what we do is we remove these redundant features uh, and we uh, do feature analysis. Uh, some features which have high correlation with other features, we remove those features. And in the second phase, we uh, do further analysis of these features to kind of distinguish key specific features from key independent features. And to understand this, consider the pressure feature. And the idea is uh, for pressure feature, the attacker may or may not apply different uh, amount of pressure for different keys. If the attacker uses same amount of pressure for different keys, uh, then this particular feature uh, is key independent for that attacker. So once we do this analysis, uh, first we find out that six features are a must. So the attacker must train for these six features. And furthermore, we find out that the first three features uh, more specifically, the touch locations and the interstroke delay are key specific features, whereas the bottom three features are key independent, which include key hold interval, touch pressure, and touch area. So this is how our training interfaces look like. So uh, first interface uh, effectively trains the attacker to mimic key independent features. And the way we do this is uh, we present some information to the attacker, ask the attacker to interact with the device, uh, and in real time we provide feedback to the attacker on how to adjust their behavior. Once the attacker does this, the attacker is uh, moved to this next interface. So here the attacker is entering password monkey, and here you see the small cursor on N. And the idea is that this cursor is going to move across these different keys uh, with same delay as the interstroke uh, delay. And the location of cursor is going to convey this information to the attacker that where the attacker needs to type. And then finally, we also provide attacker with this color-coded feedback where uh, the attacker uses the feedback that is provided to them uh, in order to adjust their behavior. And once the attacker trains on these training interfaces and feels confident, uh, we move to the attack phase. And now the attacker mounts this attack on the victim's device. So the only thing that we need to do on the victim's device is to put this small piece of tape that separates the keyboard uh, from the rest of the part of screen. And uh, I'll shortly explain why do we need to do that. This is how the device placement looks like. And this is uh, the attacker's view. So very similar uh, to the training, you can see that the attacker is being provided guidance currently, which is on uh, the key N. And finally, here is uh, how the attacker interacts with the screen. Uh, so here, the augmented reality kicks in. Uh, the attacker in real time sees the feedback as well as uh, how the attacker is entering on this keyboard. So there are some challenges uh, to this, and uh, we kind of discussed that, uh, those in length and paper. But the idea is when you're entering anything on the keyboard, 
you're going to result in these micro movements. So you may move the victim's device a little or uh, the victim device would get tilted when you're typing keys. So we have a method to deal with these. So before the attack commences uh, and when uh, the attacker's fingers are not yet occluding the screen, we take a clean image of the keyboard. And this top quadrilateral, those, so the top part of the screen, is used for tracking. So now the movements, we have taken care of those because we know exact location of the device. Uh, in real time, what we do is we uh, take this image and the clean image that was taken in the first step, uh, we rectify that uh, and paste it into correct position. And finally, what we do is uh, we uh, warp the guidance into its position uh, and it's uh, uh, made to appear uh, transparent so that the attacker can interact with the device as well as all the uh, distortions uh, are corrected using this warping. So in order to evaluate this system, we recruited 30 attackers. Uh, each attacker was assigned four victims and we used three passwords per victim. So we had these passwords monkey, password, and Iger39. These passwords come from the original work of Boostcheck and others. Each attacker was allowed 10 minutes of training per password, and in addition to offering a reward for uh, participation, we offered a performance-based reward. So every time uh, the attacker performed well, uh, we gave them uh, an additional amount. So here we have uh, results for the success of attacker. So in this plot, uh, on y-axis, we have uh, the bypass success rate for the attacker. On x-axis, we have these different passwords, so monkey, password, and Iger39. The first bar, the dark colored bar, uh, essentially uh, provides with the results of the uh, training success for the attackers. And the next bar, uh, we have the stack bar. Uh, the first one provides results for the success of the attacker for the first attempt, and the second one for the second attempt and third attempt, so on. So first of all, we see that 97% of uh, training sex, uh, sessions uh, result in uh, success. <clears throat> the kind of uh, talks about the effectiveness of our training interfaces. And out of those 97%, 81% uh, of the uh, sessions also resulted in successful attacks uh, in the first attempt. And only uh, less than 5% of uh, successful training sections uh, did not result in successful attacks. We also provide results on the uh, amount of effort the attacker needs to uh, train and mount the attacks. So we're here, uh, again, on the y-axis, we have training time uh, provided in minutes. And first, we provide uh, numbers for key independent features, so the first bar. So we see that the attacker generally needs about two minutes of training time uh, to perfectly mimic the uh, key independent features. And then later, attacker spends between one to three minutes uh, of training time for these different passwords for key specific features. So generally, attackers only need uh, between uh, three to four minutes of average time uh, to train and mimic uh, the user. So uh, in essence, we have developed this system that we have also released in open source uh, that you can use uh, and uh, uh, develop systems that evaluate security of device interaction behavior based techniques. And here uh, in this talk, we demonstrated this against keystroke. And the idea is that if someone gets your behavioral profile, uh, then that person can bypass uh, these schemes that are operating on your device. In paper, in addition to providing uh, more detailed results, we also present uh, an audio-visual method, which is a static augmented reality-based method, uh, which can be used to mount uh, attacks on keystroke behavior-based authentication. Thank you for listening. <laughs>